start, I just want to say um, thank you to um, um, my colleagues. Thank you to my colleagues. Thank you to my students for being here. Can I go? So thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. I uh, appreciate your time um, coming out um, for this. I'm just putting this together, it's, it's, it's nice, it's overwhelming. And I especially appreciate my former student coming in to grill me. Uh, <laughs> uh, I had her years ago, and um, she was a great student, Taylor Brown. Uh, I still use stories that she wrote in my classes as excellent examples of what to do. So I am 
I'm proud of her and I'm thrilled and I'm happy that she agreed to come and um, um, interview me for this. So, let's we'll get started. When he asked me to do this, he knows that I don't take public speaking very well, even when I talk to people for a living. So to agree to do this, I was like, well, I, heard, I guess I talked to her kind of oh, yeah. He taught me everything I knew, so. Obviously, everybody here knows you in some capacity, but for people that don't, can you tell them a little bit more about what you do and how you kind of got interested in writing? Okay. So I think, um, like most folks, I always, I was a reader first. Uh, I think most folks that get into writing, they're, they're readers. And, and so I read everything. Um, I was lucky to be in a household where... Okay, I got you. All right. It was... This is bit, all right, I got you. All right, so it was... Um, I grew up in a household of readers. And so I was lucky that that was the case. I had a household of readers. So it was always books. So I was always grabbing things, books off the shelves. And so that kind of um, pushed me to the next step, with, you know, to write. I want to write stories that I read. And so from a, you know, from a little kid, I, I started writing. Um, anything and everything. I, I tell folks, you know, I used to watch, you know, you, some of the older folks would know, but like um, different strokes. And, and, you know, I love that, 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 that show. And, and I would write the next episode, you know. Um, so I, I always wanted to write. And so I was just trying to figure out what I could do with my writing. Um, and as I, I went through school, I decided to join the, the, the newspaper. And, you know, I just decided that that was a more practical approach um, to my writing. Although I always wanted to do other types of writing as well. But, you know, growing up um, with a grandfather, grand, you know, growing up with my grandparents, you know, as a steel mill worker, you know, blue collar type guy, it was all about practicality. And so I, I figured if, if um, if I wanted to make a living writing, I would have to do it as a journalist, uh, as opposed to um, maybe going into writing um, novels or fiction and that type of stuff. But, you know, I got in the newspaper and, and I loved that. And um, I spent a lot of years there. And, um, and I'm happy to be here at Cal. Now it gives me an opportunity to do more than one thing. Can you talk a little bit about how your writing kind of got intertwined when you decided to join the military and what you did over there? Well, I, I think uh, when I was, when I think we're talking about my deployment. During my deployment, um, and folks, you know, when you're, when you're deployed, there's a lot of downtime. And so during the downtime, I do what I do. I, I read a lot. And I was reading um, anything I could get my hands on. I was buying, you know, buying whatever. And I was buying, uh, I think I was reading a lot of um, uh, Walter Mosley, and I was reading a lot of Eric Jerome Dickey. And I think I read Milk in My Coffee. And um, I thought it was funny. I thought it was hilarious. I'm thinking, man, I could write something like this. And so the next day, I opened up my laptop and I, start my, I started writing my, my novel. What would be my novel? You know. And how many years ago was that? Oh my gosh. That, well, that was, <laughs> you, you dug me now, you date me now. So it was like 2004. Uh, uh, you know, I, I started writing it. And I was writing it when I was away. And then when I came back, real life came back in. Um, and I stopped for a while. And then at some point I decided to pick it back up and, uh, and about a year of writing, you know, at a steady pace, I finished it. And so when did you decide to kind of move into the teaching sector after, you know, being on a beat for so long for so many different publications and working on and off with your novel? Why did you decide to take a different route? Well, I had, I, had been a, you know, I had been a reporter for 11 years. I had worked at different newspapers. And so the last paper I worked, with, worked at was at the, the Pittsburgh Tribune Review. Um, and I covered, I covered City Hall for a lot. And you know, when you cover City Hall, uh, you get burned out. And so you get recycled. Um, and you get another beat. And I think I ended up doing the police beat. And um, I thought at the police beat, I, I was thinking, you know what, maybe I want to do something different. I wasn't sure, um, but I think one day I got on, <laughs> got on the computer and, uh, and I looked on Cal's site and um, they had a job open for, open, opening for a journalism professor. And I'm thinking, I could do that. I, you know, I don't know if I could do that, I had never done it, but I'm thinking, I could, I could, I could do that. Um, and you know, I applied, which was, which was weird because I got interviewed by people that, that were my professors um, and they remembered me. So I'm glad I, had a, I have a decent reputation as, a, as an undergrad. Um, but, you know, it was, you know, um, it was a 
different transition, um, but I'm glad I made the transition because uh, I think I, I have a higher calling than I had as a, as a journalist. I, I have an opportunity to, to work with young people and, and influence them and watch them come back and be successful. And, and that's just, I mean, that's a joy. I, I love when students call me or email me, let me know what they're doing. Um, so, so I'm here, so I'm, I'm fortunate, I feel blessed. And I know you said that you, you know, had dabbled in fiction, starting writing the novels, stopping, stepping back to it. Was creative writing something you always knew you wanted to do at some point? I think I had an itch for that. And, and again, you know, um, I, and I try to use some of that creativity as, as, as a journalist, you know, as much as you can, because you gotta, you know, you have to, it has to be about the facts, right? But, you know, as I told you and I tell my students, you can still, those, you know, writing crosses over. Some of the things, whatever makes writing good, it doesn't matter what the form. But I had always wanted to do something like this. And, and again, just stepping back, I was a student at Cal. I was an undergrad here. And I tell this story, I remember I was in a class where I was writing, uh, it was a drama, like a play writing class, a script writing class. And I remember the professor said that uh, in the beginning of the semester, he said, if you get an A, I think you could probably make it as a, as a script writer. You can, you can do it. You get a B, maybe, but it would, you know, you have to kind of work at it. Um, you get a C, you, you satisfy the requirements of the course. So at the end, we had to write two scripts. And at the end of the semester, he called me into his office and he wanted to have a talk with me. And he, he, you know, he asked me, did you ever think about doing this for a living? And again, you know, I'm a practical guy. I, you know, I, it would be nice, but uh, you know, I want a job when I leave here. Uh, my parents are expecting that I have a job when I, when I get out of here. Uh, so I never pursued it, but again, that type of writing has been something I always want to do. Uh, and again, it, it speaks to the uh, professors that I've had here that they, they were encouraging and they saw something, so. So as you were you know, transitioning from beat reporting to teaching to writing creatively, did you at all struggle you know, flipping that kind of creative switch on and off through your process? I think, from class to class, sometimes I have trouble switching. If I'm, t if I'm teaching a journalism class, I think today I was, I was teaching a class and, and I think I, I used the word lead and I want to say thesis, and then in the next class I use thesis and I want to say lead. So uh, um, sometimes, yeah, you can get, you know, <laughs> get your wires crossed. But uh, no, I, you know, I've been doing journalism for a long time that, that I, I know the process. Um, this is new. This process is different. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm enjoying it. So. Can you talk to us a little bit about what inspired this? I know you said you started working on it you know, several years ago. So what kind of sparked the idea for what you know, is published in front of us today? Well, like I said, I was reading a lot of Walter Mills. Now, it's funny. When I started this, I didn't know what type of book it would be. I knew I just, you know, I like humor. And I want to kind of be funny and humorous type writing, and, and, and again, with that, uh, reading Eric Jerome Dickey's Milk of My Coffee, I wanted to do that. But then I was reading a lot of Walter Mosley, which, which you know, he writes mysteries. And so, you know, it ended up being a mystery. I, should, I shouldn't have been surprised, because that's why I was reading a lot. Um, I'm sorry, what was the other part of it, your question? No, um, where did I get it? Well, I think, I think the idea I always, want, I always had an interest about the black migration. So part of the story is looking at the black migration. Um, you, know, uh, you know, my grandparents are part of that black migration. They came from Troy, Alabama to um, Pittsburgh in the 50s. There was a community of, of black folks that, that, that you know, expatriates of the South that kind of um, lived together, uh, socialized. And so that whole migration has always been something of interest to me. So. I think that was also part of the reason what kind of you know sparked me to kind of write this and look at that subject matter. Can, so this was a little bit you know inspired by your family and you know where your family came from and some things that they went through. Um, your research process, even though you're writing fiction, how, how did that work for you? Oh, uh, it's just you know we're talking talking to folks. You know, and I think even before I was really writing this this book. Just talking to my family, my parents, you know, what was life like when you grew up? You know, talking to my mother, you know, my mother telling me, you know, that, you know, remembering drinking from a segregated uh, waterfall. This is my mother. 
Um, so it's just really, it was, it was more of a kind of a personal type, type research, you know, going through it. So in, in the book, are there, you know, characters or any situations that, you know, are kind of derived from, you know, people you've met, personality traits and things like that? All right, it's all fiction, so. <laughs> no, but, no one's in the book. It's, it, honestly, yeah, you write what you know. Yeah. And so yeah, there are characters that, that, that come a little bit from people I know, and there's, you know, there's a collection of folks, you know, like Bunky, who, you know, is a character I love that, that everyone has a cousin Bunky or someone like him, but, you know, I, I could probably have three or four cousins or relatives that are kind of like him. You know, so there's, there's some inspiration from folks, you know. My wife swears I'm James. I keep telling her I am not James. <laughs> he was a better reporter than I ever was. Um, so you get that. And it's, and it's funny, my family members, they're, they're all trying to guess, you know, and does that mean, no, no, it's not you. It's, this, is a, this is a work of fiction. Um, but there are some connections. You know, again, the main character is a reporter. Um, um, he lives in Pittsburgh, you know. Um, so there is some connection in the, 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 you know, the southern route, the, the southern um, um, background and those, those types of things. Um, even um, the name Clay Hatchie. Uh, I didn't know this when I wrote the book or when I came up with this name. I thought it was something I just came out of my mind. I saw I'm cool and I'm just going to write this, Clay Hatchie. My editor, going through the process, he said, you know this is a real place. I said, no, I didn't know that. And so I looked it up. Said, oh, it is a real place. And it's about an hour away from Troy, Alabama, where my grandparents are from. So somewhere in my head, I must have heard the word name, something like that, and it kind of stuck. So that's kind of fun. And so I kind of want to shift a little bit and talk about you know, the publishing process. You know, after you finished everything, can you talk to us about how you take that next step into getting something from a screen on a computer into a finished product? That was brutal. <laughs> All right. Um, so, you know, I was trying to find um, agents, you know. Uh, I, had a, I had a writer's market book, and I was going through that and, and trying to, you know, find the genres that was close to what my book was or what I thought it was, African American literature mystery, you know, whatever, whatever. So I was trying to find agents, I was trying to find publishing houses. And so I spent a lot of time, um, and then, you know, on the internet, and I did a lot of time just sending out um, um, letters um, about the book, you know, and, and, and trying to get a response. And I got responses, but they were like, no, thank you. <laughs> um, and, you know, after a while, I guess discouraging. And so, and I kept a list of who I sent it to, so I wouldn't keep sending it to the same person. Um, and sometimes I think it's, you know, luck happens. Sometimes it's who you know, you know. Um, and so one day, a, a guy, actually, he's a Cal U graduate, Brian Johnson, Dr. Johnson. Um, he had, um, he had po posted something on Facebook about a recent book that he had published. And I congratulated him. You know, nice job. You know, I was happy for him. I was proud of him. Then I sent them a, uh, a message and said, hey, uh, dang, I, got a, I got a manuscript. I've been, trying to, I've been trying to get it into the hands of, of a publisher. Uh, would you show it to your publisher? Would you, or no, I said, would you read it? I didn't even say, would you show it to your publisher? Well, he said, send, send me a, a synopsis. And normally, you know, a synopsis is kind of a little short summary of, of the book. So I sent him a synopsis. And he said, well, you know what? This is kind of interesting, but do it chapter by chapter. And so I, gave, I sent him a chapter chap by chapter, and he said, oh, I, I like this. I'm going to pass it on to, you, to my publisher. And he passed it on to his publisher. And I don't know how long later, it wasn't that much longer, and I got a call. Um, I got contacted somehow by the publisher, and um, he said he liked what he read, and to send um, some chapters. And so I sent some chapters. So I was prepared. So I got, sometimes it's luck, sometimes it's who you know, you know? What was it like when you got the call that they were actually going to move forward and, and make this happen? I was in my car. I was coming home from work. I think it was a beautiful fall day in 2019. And he called me, and I wasn't sure he was saying what he was saying. I had to pull my car over. I was on the highway. I was going fast. I had to pull over somewhere. And, um, and uh, it was just, yeah, it was, it was, it was exciting. It was kind of an outer body experience. Like, wow, this is, this is happening. This guy is interested in this. And uh, I, was, I was extremely thrilled. You know, I had always wanted 
to get published. You know, at least once in my life to, to at least have some book of, of fiction. Um, and so, yeah, I was always thrilled by it. And how has it been for you, know, you know, over the last several weeks, getting to um, talk to people that spread it, getting their feedback, getting maybe their criticism? How's it been for you seeing this in other people's hands and hearing you know, what they have to say about what you did? Well, let me say this. When you put something out there, and I guess anyone who's creative or people who put things out there or put themselves out there, it's scary as hell. It's frightening. Because now, you know, when you put it out there and it's your baby, you don't want anybody to call your baby ugly. And so, you know, you put it out there and you, you hope for the best. Um, and, and, you know, for the most part, the responses have been really good. You know, you know but it, not everyone loves it, you know. And, and so you, you have to just, you know, everyone's allowed to have their, their view and their perspective. But uh, for the most part, it's been, it's been positive and, and it's, been, it's been reaffirming. Um, and I'm enjoying it. It's, it's different, you know, because as a writer, you just think about the writing. You don't think about anything else. And it's the whole thing after the writing. It's the marketing of it. It's the using social media. It's, um, you know, getting your, your page up, your branding, you know, which as a journalist is kind of opposite of how we, how we think. You know, it's awkward. And being interviewed, you know, it's, it's kind of weird. Like, hold on, I'm, I'm supposed to be asking you questions. Uh, why are you asking me questions? Uh, but it's, it's fun, you know, so I'm lucky. I mean, uh, my, my daughters are really good with social media. They're really good with marketing. My one daughter here, Amaya Carlisle and, and Ariel, they've been helping their old man with, with things. And in fact, Amaya took the picture that's on the cover and her sister um, did the editing. So um, they've been really helpful for that. So it's just, it's, it's a learning curve, you know. I mean, I'm enjoying it. You know, the podcast, I had never done a podcast. and. Uh, and, uh, and it's, you know, it's been fun. So I'm just, I'm open to, to the process. And um, I think it's something everybody's probably curious about. Um, as stressful as it was, you know, getting from point A to point B, and as long as the process was, and with all the ups and downs, is this something you think you might want to try again with uh, another story? Oh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I got to. Yeah, I got the bug now. I've been bitten. Didn't you tell me that? Like, once you gets in your blood, mm -hmm. and once, once it gets in there, so yeah, absolutely. I have, I have some ideas um, that I'm thinking about, and then you know, folks have read this book. They've connected to the, the characters, and, and so they've said, oh, "Are you going to write something else with these characters?" And so I had thought about it, but now I'm thinking more and more uh, about maybe doing something again along, uh, maybe a sequel or something or a prequel to um, to this this story. Very cool. Yeah. And I think all of that, but I think people probably want to get to you and hear a little bit more. Um, being that you have a lot of students here, and I'm not sure who's watching online, but um, you know, advice for them, maybe if they're you know working on something in their spare time, or if they want to get into news, or even the more creative aspect of it, some tips. Uh, I would say again, and I always tell students that you know, here's the time to to work on your your craft, hone your skills. Um, you know, work on your things that, that, that are your weaknesses, work on them now, um, because we're, we're kind of forgiven here. Uh, you, you know, you're allowed to make stake, mistakes here, but work on the things that are gonna improve you. Um, if you're dedicated to something, to some type of, you know, writing or whatever your passion is, you know, then go for it. Um, go full out, you know, do the best that you can. And, and you know, um, don't listen to naysayers, even if the naysayer is you. Because sometimes we can talk ourselves out of doing things. Uh, we don't think we're good enough. Um, and, and a lot of times you are, I mean, you are good enough. And so, again, you know, just if you have a passion, you have a desire to do something, you know, work at it, work at it, work hard at it, believe in yourself, and things will happen. Things will happen. And I think, I think with the book, you know, um, although I was getting told no, 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 I thought, that I wrote something pretty decent. And I had enough belief in it. I thought I wrote something decent that somebody would, would want to read it. And so I never gave up the hope that, that, that it would be published. And so again, you know, you know stand firm in, 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 um, in the things you want to do and don't let folks um, dissuade you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Oh, Thanks for asking me to come and let me put you on the hot seat. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll, I'll read now if my computer's up, I'm hoping.
so the, the section that I'm going to read from is, is from the first chapter. And James um, finally um, um, arrives in, um, in Alabama. And so if, I'm not sure we even gave an overview of the, of the piece. So the story is about a young man uh, who's a reporter, upcoming reporter. Um, and his, his mother, you know, she's dying, and her dying wish is to be buried uh, in her hometown of Clayhatchee, um, uh, Alabama. And he, he finds it a strange request, and he's a bit annoyed by it as well because it's taken away from his work. But for the love of his mother, um, he decides to, um, um, you know, fulfill her wish. And as he does this, as he um, goes through this process, he uncovers um, secrets about the family. And he comes to closer to understanding why his mother um, asked for this, um, for this request and why it was so important to her. All right, this came up, so that's a good thing. So I've done this, I haven't practiced reading this with my mask on, I probably should have. But uh, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. All right. Mama knew, Mama knew love, I could tell you. She knew tenderness. Amen, James. Your mama had a true Christian charity by her, not a holy on Sunday Christianity. Have you heard the story of Jughead, I asked? Jughead, no. Jughead was this white man in his early 30s who used to ride around on a bicycle. Seriously, he was the foulest, nastiest bum in town. One day, Mama asked him if he were hungry. He said yes. She fed him. Put him to feed anybody who needed a meal, said Aunt Dee. Well, she also asked him if he needed a place to stay and welcomed him into her home. He stayed for six months. Lord, Bill old Aunt Dee. One day when Mama was um, doing her errands, Daddy had a heart-to-heart -heart, um, with Jughead. When Mama returned, Jughead had moved, moved on out. Mama cried. That's how she was. Your daddy certainly could be persuasive, Aunt Dee said. I laughed, <clears throat> I laughed with her, uh, earning another hug. The South calls for a slower tempo. I hadn't looked at my watch once, and we hadn't moved from our spot on the front porch since I arrived. Boy, when was the last time you had a home-cooked meal? You've probably been living on that fast food mess since you left your mama's house, living up there in that New York. I know you haven't had any real down-home food in a long time. Go on upstairs and freshen up. I'll get you some real food. I walked up the narrow steps uh, on the walls leading up to the top with family pictures, cousins, aunts, uncles, and my immediate family. There was a black and white picture of my mother with a rag on her head and sandals on her feet. She could have, she could have been more than 16 years old. She was thin. She had a slight grin on her face as she tilted her head to the right side and placed her hands on her hips. On another wall hung a picture of 20-something daddy in his army uniform holding two fists in each arm. Couldn't make out the brand of spirits, but if I had to guess, he's probably carrying a Canadian Windsor. That whiskey sat on our shelves in our homes as long as I could remember. Dad stood tall, thin, and confident with a rare smile on his face. Under that picture was a photo of my siblings in their Sunday best. Francis looked to be six, Mark four, and Cecilia two. I had always loved that picture for some reason. Mama had the same picture of those three hanging on our wall at home. James, hurry on down before that food gets cold on D. Yale. Here I come, Auntie. I sat down to a spread of fried chicken, black eyed peas, some collard greens, macaroni and cheese, cornbread, and a large glass of lemonade. Aunt D, what am I gonna do with all this food? You gonna eat it, boy? You haven't gotten that big that I couldn't put a hide to your butt. Oh, please don't. I haven't forgotten the last time you put a hide to me. I like my hide the way it is, bruised feet. Bruce Free, I said. You know, you know they put people in jail for that now. Aunt Dee replied with a laugh. My God, I could tell you, you have enough food here to feed an army. First boy, stop using the Lord's name in vain, she scolded. You trying to get your butt whooped? Sorry, ma'am. So how's Bunky these days? Well, you know your good for nothing cousin Bunky lives down the street with his good for nothing woman. Isn't that his wife? Don't interrupt me, child. She's his common in law. I guess you can call Gloria his wife if you want to use those terms. I know he's taking care of her children, three children with diff three different men. I told Bunky, I don't know how he's gonna take care of her three children with the two children um, that he has with Laura. Bunky works at that water plant now, and all of his money is going to child support. 
for his own children. That boy is just hard-headed. Been that way all his life. I should have beat his ass more. Oh, Aunt D, I said, surprised. I don't know why. Hey, you act like you ain't heard me cuss, she boomed. I might be a Christian, but I still cuss like a sailor. Pray for me, child. Bunky should be on his way soon. Monkey's Aunt D's youngest child. Um, he's five years older than I am, and he's a mess. Monkey's the type of mess that you thought was cool when you were a teenager and you didn't know any better. He made drug using and selling seem cool. He made juggling four or five girls seem cool. He made being a teen father seem cool. Auntie, Auntie called him a 34-year-old wannabe playboy. From talking to him on the phone occasionally, I knew he hadn't moved beyond adolescent much in action and attitude. Bunky still talked junk, and he still spent all his time chasing women. He still slung dope even with his municipal water plant job. And he was still a mama's boy. From what I gathered from Aunt D, Monkey stayed right around the corner from her house, close enough to move back in if, if, with his mom if his old lady got tired of him. It appeared that all, fa all the family members uh, remained close to home. In fact, two of Aunt D's children live in a block with their grown children. As they all started to come in to see their northern cousin, it did not take long for me to become dizzy with introductions of cousins, aunts, uncles, and friends of the family. A blur of faces, kisses, hugs, and smiles danced in front of me as people faded in and out all afternoon. When you get in, James, Aunt Arlene asked. Aunt Arlene actually was my cousin, but she seemed so much older that I just always called her aunt. She was Aunt Dee's oldest daughter with quite a few years on her younger brother, Bunky. Arlene had to be at least 55 years old now. She gave me a big hug, a kiss, and smothered me with her, full, uh, with her fluffiness. She was round, soft, chocolate, and she had hair on her chest, still. I remember that as a kid when I first saw her. But standing in her bearded chest, Aunt Early still had an attractive face. The rumor was she was fine in her youth, men chasing after her like bees to honey. Today she was just sweaty with a do-rag on her head. Boy, you've gotten so handsome. I'm sorry about your mama. Putin was proud of you. Jared was proud of you too, even if he didn't say so. Jared was my father's nickname. Never knew what the R stood for and never thought to ask, for that matter. Nonetheless, J.R. and Putin are what their family and friends Clay had to use when referring to them. That Uncle J.R. and Putin's youngin'? Cousin Willie asked. What up, boy? Seeing my hesitation, Aunt Earlene jumped in. Willie said hi. She giggled. Oh, yeah, I remember Cousin Willie. Earlene's oldest child was two years older than his mother's brother, which meant Bunk was Willie's uncle. I never could understand Willie when I was a kid, and nothing had changed. All these relatives were country, but Willie was country. Damn. Hey, Willie, good to see you, I said, dapping up my cousin. Look at you, big time city reporter, Aunt Arlene continued. So are you on television? No, Aunt Arlene, I'm a print journalist. I work for New York Times, New York Daily, Daily News. I write about politics. I guess that's good too, Aunt Arlene said, still smiling or maybe smirking, I couldn't tell. Whenever someone found out I was a reporter, the first thing they asked me was what television station I was on. Couldn't a brother just write? The next question was always, do you write about sports? Couldn't a brother just write about something other than sports? I was spared from the sports question because at that moment, Bunky sauntered into the house, cornrows and all, announcing his arrival. Bunky in the house, he said, kissing relatives as he walked past. Then he saw me. Is that my little cousin from Pittsburgh? Damn, boy, you ain't so little anymore. In fact, you look a little chubby. Just playing, man. Good to see you. Sorry about the circumstances, but it's damn good to see you again. He said as he pulled me into him. My southern families were huggers. He has gotten big, Aunt Early said. James was just a squirt. He has meat on his bones now. He's so handsome. Bunky, your cousin was telling us about his big time job working for the newspaper. Bunky stepped back, looked at me. He still had both of his hands on his arms as if to inspect me better. And by the look in his eyes, I knew what he was going to say next. What are you covering? Sports? Bunky asked. Damn, really? Have you met Michael Jordan? How about Barry Sanders? I tried not to roll my eyes, but it was hard. I don't cover sports, I said, as I took a seat on Aunt Dee's animal pattern couch that sagged in the middle. I cover politics, city council, mayor's office, local government, state, and national elections. I guess you haven't met anyone famous, Bunky said, with a hint of disappointment in his voice. No, I've met plenty of famous people. Bill Clinton, Jesse Jackson, Colin Powell, Mayor Rudy Giuliani. Bunky didn't seem impressed. So I threw in Jamie Foxx, Tisha Campbell, and Ice-T. Now you're talking, cuz. Is Tisha as fine in person as she is on TV? That boy, that boy Martin Lewis is crazy. 
I got a fool with that girl driving her from that shit. That nigga crazy. Hey, 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 I don't hear any of that bunky on D set, leaning forward as if to get up. Sorry, man. Letitia is fine. Yeah, she is. In fact, she looks better in person. I miss my days covering entertainment. But politics is exciting in a whole different way. Politics, unrolling, said curling up her lips. I know you keep a headache. Can't trust any of them, Democrats, Republicans. But I'm glad to see you. I wish it was under better circumstances, but you're home, and your mother's home now, too. You met Ice-T, Bunky interrupted. He's on that show where he plays a cop. How's Ice-T? Ice-T is cool, I said, pun fully intended. Monkey slapped me on my shoulder. We got a regular celebrity in our house, mama, Monkey said to Aunt D. Boy, leave that boy alone, Aunt D admonished Monkey, who was grinning wildly with a gold tooth in full view. Nah, I'm proud of him, I'm proud of him. I wanna show him off to the hood, Monkey said as he turned to me. Hey James, you wanna take a ride with me? I have to take care of a few things and I won't take long. Do I really wanna ride with him? Who knows where he's gonna take me? I avoided dives and drug homes since graduating from college. I wasn't being bougie, but I just didn't think of any other places Bunky um, would take me. That's my man, but I haven't forgotten his propensity for the CD. Well, what the hell? Sure, let's ride. Aunt, Aunt D and Earlene seemed to create a fortress of flesh, flab, and determination in front of the door with matching sets of folding arms and disapproving eyes. Bucky, where are you taking James, Aunt D said. Don't be taking him to any of those rough projects, to any of those hose girls' houses. In fact, James just arrived. Let him sit a while, let him rest. Start dragging him around all over town. You ain't taking him to any whorehouses, Aunt Earlene chimed in. Would y'all all just chill? A myth Bunky said, I got my cousin. Only respectable places. I'm fine, ladies, I said. Bunky turned to his nephew. You wanna ride, Willie? Nah, I got some business. Bunky glanced my way. If you didn't quite catch that particular addiction or flourish, Bunky deadpan, Willie said no. Well, maybe, uh, maybe we could get out and see the area where my parents grew up, I said to Bunky. Mama talked about this place all the time. Okay, I guess it'll be all right, Aunt D interrupted. Y'all be careful, take care of your cousin, Bunky. Nothing to worry about, Mama. I won't keep him long, Bunky said, as we walked out the door with his arm around my shoulders. Bunky led me to his classic 1994 white Cadillac. I could tell it was his pride and joy by the way he approached it, majestic like. Bunky had the ride souped up, new stereo system, shiny rims, woofers in the trunk. He put in a ludicrous CD. You ready to see the dirty, dirty saw? Bunky asked as he blasted ludicrous, a little blunt, I'm ready. Thank you. I think this is the time for questions, so I'll take any questions. We have a question. <laughs> sure. From our rear and cyberspace, <laughs> this comes from Ari Alex, and she asks the following question. Does Salsa play out to as an intriguing story and an eventful read? I thoroughly enjoyed it. What is one thing you want readers to resonate with from the book, and who are your favorite and least favorite characters from all right, so the thing that I want people, I want to see that resonates from this book is that, you know, the story is talking about ghosts, you know, um, with souls, ghosts, and things that we haven't dealt with. And I think, you know, part of the issue is that when we don't deal with things from our past, they keep coming to our present, and they affect our future. And, I, and, and we see this now with us as a country not dealing with um, some of the things that we've, we've had in the past. And so it kind of plays out. I didn't think I was writing that type of book, but, um, but I did, you know? And, and again, with, um, with the main characters, you know, really um, the implication of not dealing with things in the past because if you don't, um, they're, gonna, they're gonna affect everything else. Now, the characters that, that I resonated with, I mean, look, Bunky and James, you know, just, I, I, just, I, I enjoyed those, those characters. Um, James, because again, you know, um, he's a reporter. A lot, you know, he reminds me a lot of me, but he's not me. Um, but um, and, and Bunky, Bunky was just, especially Bunky. Bunky, you see growth with Bunky. You see growth in his in his um, character as you go through, and uh, and he has more layers to him than um, um, than you would expect. And that was my my oldest daughter. She's a ringer for me as well. So. <laughs> Thank you. I'll give you some money when I get home. I 
No, I, I cannot. <laughs> uh, I, it, well, there is some family, there are some things that have happened in the past with that family. Um, and there's just, you know, James is coming to terms with, with things that have happened with this particular family that he did not know. One of the reasons why his father, and I'll get you a little bit, his father hates the South. His father doesn't want to go there. That's one of the reasons why his mother never returned, because his father has such a hatred of things that, you know, about that, you know, about things that happened back there that he wanted to leave it behind. Uh, so not, I don't want to give too much away, but yeah, it's, just, it's, it's things that uncover about the family that, that he did not know. Come on. I started, I think I started with the first chapter, but I don't know if the first chapter was the way it looks now, um, but I think I just, I think my, my process was linear. I don't, I don't think I started somewhere and I came back. So I, it, was, it was fairly, well, it was linear because I didn't necessarily knew, I didn't know where I was going. I, I started to develop the characters. Uh, I knew I wanted to talk about the migration, so that aspect of it. Uh, but I think as I got to know the characters, the story started to develop from the characters, maybe. Um, so, but it was, it was a linear process. And that's one of my other former students there, too. She's a poet. <laughs> questions, questions. Do you have another question? Okay. Sure. I mean, I mean the greats, you know, uh, Richard Wright, you know, James Baldwin, you know, Tony Morrison, and Alice Walker. Um, I'm starting to read some new guys like Damian Young now, um, but the classic folks. Um, I've been reading, reading, and teaching. Um, so yeah, that's that's about it. Colton Wife. Um, Dialogue when I was trying to do Southern dialogue, that was that was hard, and um, and I, I went back and when I submitted, you know, the publisher, you know, he said hey, you need to you need to make it more Southern. I'm thinking I don't know how to talk Southern, or I don't know how to write Southern, and then you know then uh, you're, you're writing. So as a as an English professor, um, you want to write properly. So then you're you know you're going against the grain of trying. Okay, this doesn't seem grammatically correct, or this doesn't whatever. So it was. That was more of a battle, was the dialect, and trying to get the dialect as right as I could, you know. So I'm, I'm trying to listen to people. I'm trying to Google, like, why do Southern folks sound? Um, so that was some of the research as well. So, um, yeah. The narration, the story, I think, was easier, but the dialogue, and wanting the dialogue to sound, sound real, you know. Any of my journalism students, any student in my journalism class here? Because I was going to start yelling at y'all. Ask me some questions. Just here for extra credit. That's it. The bonus points. The bonus points are coming Monday. It'll be there. Yes. I did not hear that question. Maybe we need to give, give people a mic or something. So say it one more time. How uh, I, I think, again, you know, even without trying who you are, you know, your experiences, they just, they bubble up. You know, they, they're going to impact everything you do because this is what you know 
And so good writers, they say, you know, they work from what they know. Um, and so that was the case with, with this process. Um, I think, again, some of my background, some of my family's background kind of helped influence this particular story. You know, again, that migration from the South and what it's like, and, and also the tension um, between um, Southern relatives and Northern relatives, the tension between relatives who are um, maybe not as educated as you are, you know, so you see that, you know, with, even with, you see that with the writing playing out, with a lot of African-American literature in the 20th century and the 21st century, where African-Americans start to move up. And so again, family members kind of moved away or in a different bracket than the other family members, because some of them didn't, they got left behind. Uh, so kind of, you, you kind of see that tension a little bit in this book as well, you know? Questions, questions. Okay, Alexis. That's a really good question. What would I tell myself to make a process? Huh. Huh, huh, huh. I don't know what I would tell myself um, because I think just with everything I've done in my life, I've always kind of just jumped into things, you know? Uh, I don't know if I would have given myself some advice. Um, I mean, it's been my life. I joined, you know, I, I tell the story with the military. I joined the military like a day after, like I met, I came, it was my sophomore year, and I wanted to talk about, about the reserves, and I went to the ROTC building just because this was an Army guy, and, um, and I, just wanted to inf I just wanted information. And, and the Major, well, Major Bell, he said, come on in, I got something better. By the time we got done talking, I had a duffel bag and, and tickets for Fort Knox, Kentucky. So that's kind of, my, that's kind of how my life has been. You know, um, even jumping into um, um, becoming a professor, same thing. You know, just, I had thought it through, just, you know, I had a notion, I had a feeling, I thought I could do this, and I jumped into it. And I think the same thing with, with writing. Uh, I think if I had told myself something, I might have taught myself out of the process. I mean, anything, just to be patient, um, just believe in yourself. Uh, um, you know, and, and, you know, and just understand that, that if you keep pushing that eventually uh, somebody's gonna see or find value in your work. Yes. I'm sorry, I can't even say it again. I, I didn't hear you. I think when I wrote the book, I made, I made James a little more judgmental. And I attempted to, to cut some things out. I didn't cut as much out. And I think if, if uh, going back to the other question, if I had something to do, I would say, hey, maybe check James a bit. Because um, James gets on his high horse a little bit. And he starts to preach. And, and, and when he preaches, sometimes he doesn't think about uh, systemic issues. Uh, and I think I was a little heavy-handed one way with James, and I went as much as I could to kind of um, bring that back. And it goes far. Uh, but if I had, I think, yeah, if I had to start the story again, maybe I would have looked at that differently. All right. Yes. I, 
I, I can't even, now I can't remember. I, I, did, I did a lot of cutting. <laughs> uh, and so I did, you know, part of the book, there's a lot of flashback. And I had, I can't even remember the scene, but it was, it was, it was just a, a, you know, three or four pages of, of a flashback. And the editor said, um, we gotta cut it. And I'm thinking, why, it's, it's pretty good. And, and, and he gave me his reasons why, and um, I didn't really fight him on it, but I, I thought it was, it, was, it was pretty good. So, I mean, sometimes you have to not, you know, you can't fall in love with your writing, because, you know, there's the revision process. And, you know, I think it's better, that because the story is, is leaner, um, people can get through it, uh, but, I thought that was a pretty important scene, but I guess it wasn't that important because, again, the book works well. So I think the lesson is, again, just you can't fall in love with, you know, you're going to revise. You're going to revise. You have to be open to that revision and do it often. Every time I thought the book was done, <laughs> you know, uh, it was more revisions. You know, just do this, you know, do that. And like, okay, I thought we were ready to go. Um, that's just part of the process. Seems like class. Did you read the, do the reading? What do you think? What are your thoughts? Talise, what you got? I know, I know Talise guys, so I'm calling Talise out. I'm calling Talise out. She's in my comp class. <laughs> and I'm gonna leave you alone, Talise. Well, I, I think there's no more questions. Uh, I, I appreciate you coming. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I, I thank everyone who put this together. You know, you know, um, Dr. Murray, Dr. Gill, Dr. Fasani for your help. Thank the tech folks. You know, um, um, it just it, it, it warms my heart that, um, that you thought enough of me and of my work to um, to do this. So, so thank you guys for coming in. And my student, my former student, who I'm, I'm, I'm immensely proud of. Thank you for uh, for coming out here now and um, grilling me sort of growing me. The book is here if you're interested. Um, you know, I'll be here. I'll, if you have a copy, I'll sign books. But thank you all. <laughs>